at. Perfect. Thank you, Caitlin. Right on cue. Um, okay, so I want to dive a little bit into just sort of scene setting uh, for this call uh, to also give a little bit of a sense of that this this is, you know, we've done a variety, we've done webinars, we've done conversations around the future of open scholarship. There's been a variety of things over the past year. Um, this sort of mechanism is going to be sort of these community sessions. And what we're excited about is that the intent is sort of to have these continue to be something that IOI is going to do. Um, spaces where IOI can share a bit more under the hood in terms of what is happening from a strategy perspective, what what decisions the organization is making, what are things that are happening uh, that you may be part of or see, or the things that are happening that you don't necessarily know, um, to also give a space where we can share kind of the thought and process that's going into some of the decisions. Because I think the thing that we know, it's really important to make sure that you know, while a lot of thoughtful decisions are going on behind the scenes with a group of people, that is not always shared or seen. And so we want to make sure we're creating spaces to share the things that are happening and why they're happening, and then also to give space for, um, you know, listening and learning and feedback um, in sort of this way. So we'll see kind of more of these, both as things happen at IOI, whether it's uh, strategic work, research, uh, steering committee, uh, the various councils that are going to start to happen. There's a lot, there's a lot going on and it's a very exciting time for IOI. Um, with that, I want to also note, you know, we definitely also want to be clear that there are going to be a set of expectations as we always do when we bring, come together in community, because we will be sharing things that are, you know, rooted in the strategy and the work, uh, things that might not be fully developed or things that might be midway starter or complete, you know, as with everything, you know, the intent is that this will be a respectful space of listening uh, and conversation. Um, we expect that not everybody's going to agree with all the things that will probably be shared because, you know, strategy is sticky and complicated. Um, but we want to make sure that we have the space nonetheless. So that's always sort of our ask. Um, with that, this particular session is going to be focused on um, governance, oversight, and accountability, my favorite things. I even brought my, it's backwards, but I brought my Woo, Con, and Cantor coffee mug and my continual love for the FTC. Uh, it felt appropriate to drink out of, drink my co iced coffee out of that for this particular session. Um, for this, we're going to kind of break it up into three parts that kind of build on this and because it really is about an ecosystem and, a, and a, a holistic approach. So Caitlin's, you know, I think, again, things that you've seen probably in emails and tweets and blog posts, but we're going to kind of share it all together. Uh, Caitlin's going to walk through a bit again of the three year strategic plan work that happened. Um, Caitlin, and then we also have Catherine Skinner from the current steering committee to talk a bit about the steering committee update. Um, I know folks may have seen sort of the call for nominations, so there's a lot of interesting stuff to share in that. Um, and then I'm going to come back in to really talk about kind of the nuts and bolts of what is happening with the Community Oversight Council and how that really kind of is like sort of the third stool of this particular picture of things. So with that, I will stop talking. Um, and I will share it over with Caitlin. Great, thanks. And Vanessa, do you want to keep? Okay, I was going to say if you want to keep sharing slides, we can also go with that. Um, so a huge thanks for that. Uh, for I believe I've met most of you so far, but if not, uh, my name is Caitlin Thaney. I'm the executive director of Invest in Open Infrastructure. It's great to see you all. Thanks for joining. Um, we've had quite a bit of uh, work, especially as we look forward to the next three years um, in developing not only our strategy, but communicating that out and now starting to operationalize it. That, you know, outside of the documents that have been shared out, which I'll, you know, add links here in the chat and we um, have these resources on our website, wanted to speak through, like talk through a little bit more about how we're envisioning some of these pieces coming together and why we're talking about not only community oversight and tech oversight in the context of our work, but also what the purpose of the community councils and how we're thinking about governance as means of further operationalizing and supporting um, this work going forward. And so uh, just a few months ago, we released a, a three-year strategic plan um, that was designed not only in collaboration with 
our steering committee informed by our research over the past year, especially with the Future Fulfillment Scholarship Project, uh, but also was open for a community consultation with about 55 kind of key stakeholders in our work uh, to help further design and iterate on that. Um, and some of the key elements there, I mean, IOI, our kind of core, core work, especially over the year ahead, is really to start to think through, you know, how can we not only build out that research and evidence base to support, you know, making recommendations about prioritizing open infrastructure needs to benefit the community, but starting to get into some of that definitional work of when we talk about open infrastructure, what do we mean? What sort of scoping are we talking about in terms of how we prioritize that? And also, you know, when we think about infrastructure that helps further equitable access and participation in research and scholarship for whom, to what extent, and what makes the most, um, you know, where are there kind of most pressing needs that we can help uh, enact change, you know, um, by moving forward. And so we've built out, um, currently we've got two research data analysts who recently joined us who are starting to do some of the investigation. And you've seen some of this work kind of peppered through not only the strategic plan, but also through some of the things we've been communicating about investigating economics and the funding data around this. Um, but really thinking about developing that framework for how we prioritize and assess projects and do those needs. Um, we also are really keenly aware, and this gets into governance as well, about the um, potential risk of harm that just exists based on the intersection that we operate in. Um, you know, we're talking about open source technology. We know that there are significant levels of bias and inequities and um, issues there writ large. We also are talking about higher ed, research, places where, you know, we are kind of operating in these areas of tension and um, significant investment and money and prestige and, you know, exclusion in various ways that can, you know, take on multiple forms. And then beyond that, we are also, um, you know, on an organization that is there to provide support to increase funding and resourcing. You know, there's a, an element there, not only in terms of the sustainability of the kind of temporality of that, of looking at making recommendations that will be hopefully sustained over a longer period of time, but we are talking about money, we're talking about resources, we're talking about attention in various elements. And so um, over the course of the last 18 months, been working um, with our steering committee and also community members to think through, you know, what are the ways in which, you know, for that broader ecosystem, um, when we think about how not to create additional kind of challenges for other elements or, you know, exacerbate the problems that we know are already persist in the space of, you know, projects, certain projects getting more funding than others based on attention certain projects based on where they're based in the world, um, other challenges in terms of perceived scarcity in terms of philanthropic funding or institutional funding and some of these other methods um, about how we can start to unpick that. And so the work kind of moving forward outside of building out that research and evidence space and being radically transparent about our work as we do that, um, the community oversight component arose out of this discussion of when we talk about assessing projects for openness, for, you know, embeddedness, for usability, for utility, for, you know, values alignment in the broader space. Um, we did a number of different experiments over the past year in thinking through what does decision making look like? How can we support institutions and, and institutional leaders, users? funders, et cetera, and making those choices and alleviating to the decision fatigue. And also what's missing from those current, you know, checklists and operationalizing. Um, and from our discussions last fall, we had a series of workshops that a number of you participated in for the Future Open Scholarship work to say, okay, what values and principles guide your work, guide your decision making? And we had an incredibly rich like discussion about all of the various elements that kind of come to play, but then also when it came to thinking about the efficiency or speed of rolling out software, you know, where that prioritization can, can come at a bit of a rub. And also thinking through, you know, some of the additional pieces of news that we've heard about over the last 
gosh, it's not even just been through the pandemic, but even more so, but again, louder over the course of the past 18 months about the significant privacy implications, the you know, data usage implications, the societal implications about how these pieces of technology impact those that are at the core of what we do in terms of the researchers, the practitioners, and the users of this work, those that we want to be able to participate in this, um, in this space. And so that, you know, Vanessa was working with us on the Future Open Scholarship Project, um, which very much influenced our strategy. You'll see a lot of that reflected in how we've built out this work and expanding beyond, you know, just scholarship to also look at research tools, but also thinking about what are the leverage points, not only in terms of providing, say, investment guidance or strategic, you know, guides for institutions to choose infrastructure or have better um, sight into where to best direct funds to help support the ecosystem, um, but really thinking about how do we grow the uptake and the adoption of open infrastructure? How do we further a shared agenda of those looking to invest and help sustain open infrastructure? What are the tactics and um, you know, collective action opportunities we should be prioritizing? And how do we put that into play? But also thinking about you know, when it came to that discussion about how we make those decisions, realizing that that's not something that I, I think IOI should hold on its own. Um, that is in many ways how some of, the, some of the issues that persist in terms of bias or you know, often we, we refer to it in our team as money begets money, you know, and, and we also are those that are you know re recipients of that and, and reaping those rewards of you know attention kind of follows on attention you know it becomes a sort of trust metric of if you can get funding from a few funders then you become more known in the space and so you know what are the checks and balances for our work also how can we ensure that the work that we're doing is responsive to the community needs rec recognizing that we operate across a few different communities and around different um, subject areas. And so, you know, that's where the thought of the community councils as sort of the non-voting bodies that help inform our work, not only for IOI leadership, but also for the steering committee and ensuring we have that regular conversation um, to help ensure that we're you know, staying attuned to the needs of those that we're looking to serve. Um, but also in terms of on a longer term horizon, um, having a space where we can say, here are the things that really concern, you know, members of the community, whether it's the Clarivet and ProQuest acquisition, whether it's changes in legislation, whether it's restrictions in other parts of the world that could have knock-on effects that, you know, can help with that sort of um, field scan to ensure that we're keeping our eyes open and helping to um, tailor our strategies to adjust for that. And apologies for hearing the children's background. Um, but in addition to that, um, also, you know, if we move forward in making recommendations for further investment, wanting to make sure that that is given sort of a gut check um, by trusted members of the community that can assess that for things that we might be missing. You know, we think about the things that fall in between those, um, those cracks, such as, you know, are there bad actors associated? Does it look great on paper? But is it, you know, it's not just it may be a nonprofit versus for-profit thing. There might be other usability issues. There might be history there that, you know, might affect that, um, you know, in some cases, other peers in the broader space in terms of providing recommendations of the size. I'm um, referred to it as sort of like the moral judgments and moral weights and how can we be transparent about that, but also ensure that we've got mechanisms that can allow for those conversations to happen um, and feedback mechanisms that can, you know, fold into our work to ensure that we're not operating blindly um, in, in missing some of the broader context around that work too. So I'll pause there for a moment because I know that that was a lot <laughs> and uh, Vanessa, or others, if there's any questions, please feel free to let me know. Zelda has a question. I know, that's our dog. <laughs> I can hear in the background. <laughs> okay. And if there's no questions, I'm happy to kind of talk through um, the next piece on the governance side, and then we can kind of save space at the end as well. So feel free to um, either raise your hand or add a question to the chat. Um, again, you know, just sort of sharing like where we're thinking of these pieces, how they came to like live in this broader um, 
-hmm. broader you know strategic plan and how we're thinking about acting upon those over the next um, over the next few months and the next year especially. Christina, I saw you unmute in terms of your video. Did you want to chime in? You know me, I always, <laughs> hi everyone, I'm Christina Drummond. Um, I'm the program officer for the Open Access eBook Usage Data Trust and I'm based at Edgecopia. Um, and I apologize, I'm outside and I know it's terribly loud. Um, but my quick question really is one with respect to um, the national policy bodies. And uh, just, I was wondering if you could comment for a moment, because I know we have a lot of the kind of grass tops leaders collected here. And I was wondering if you could speak to how we can, you know, what's envisioned for syncing up with those in the academies and those who are kind of setting the, the federal policy agendas, not only here in the US, but also in Europe. It's a, that's a great question. Um, so in terms of the community oversight work, Vanessa will be talking through a little bit more about how we're envisioning the structure for those groups, um, you know, very much designed to not be led by myself or IOI staff very much operating in support. So we will have some community members who will be chairing that group. Um, and so thinking through what that structure looks like, I will say in addition to that, so, you know, that could very much be a part of that work in terms of thinking about what the response of like the rapid response, you know, more kind of advocacy kind of um, take and also how they want to engage, how we should be engaging with those um, spaces. You know, there's some mechanisms there to ensure that that conversation has a place in that mechanism. In addition to that, um, this was one of the things that came up when it uh, we were not only talking about convenings and events and engagement, you know, and I know we, we have um, often use the language of like putting research into action, you know, not just being a think tank to develop reports, but really thinking about, you know, how we can start to bring individuals together, run pilots, move um, intentionally through operationalizing that work. Um, we are currently scoping a position for an engagement lead to think really deeply about what that structure looks like, um, and whether or not that's you know, various roundtables and councils and, um, you know, smaller focused discussions with those sorts of experts to understand what operationalizing pieces of the work look like while also having opportunities for the public to engage. Um, there's a number of different ideas we're kind of bandying about, um, but it is something that I know we want to have uh, really thoughtful, dedicated sort of engagement on. That will be kind of mapped out over the next, uh, I would say, the next six months in terms of that strategy. It's a, it's a great call. Um, I will add just one piece of that, sort of like on the newer, but the, um, and I think as Caitlin said, and we'll talk more about this with the council piece, you know, I think the intent is, is really to start to, over the course of this year is really thinking about and developing like what is coalition building, what does advocacy work look like, what does policy work look like, I mean, as we all know, any one of those could have their own giant teams in and of themselves so, um, and I, as we not surprisingly I definitely personally love the policy piece. Um, what I will put out there, um, because in terms of like opportunities happening now, um, is that um, specifically for uh, researchers, academic researchers, there is some space right now um, within the, the current and FTC environment to have researchers come in to specifically look at one specific topic. So kind of looking at things under what's called a 6B or potentially looking at things under like policy statements. And that's some work that I'm doing um, as well. And so I think it's worth dropping into this because again, if there is people either on this call or people that are in your academic circles that might, you know, be interested in, you know, we're seeing clearly with, you know, recent with, you know, work with the FTC that there is, in, you know, interest in sort of bolstering research in some of these spaces or exploring what those look like or, or having positions. Um, I'd say hit, send me a note on the side, but I think that that is stuff that definitely should be like, I think there's a hunger right now for more of these type of policy spaces. And I think IOI and the council are a great place to start. And there's some other spaces too to just further elevate the voices of this, this group and, the, and, and that there's this thinking, which, you know, I think is great. So that's my coffee mug. It's fine. Yeah. And we will be, um, I think that might be a good segue unless folks have other burning questions to also talk about the governance component because the next piece that you know thinking through 
that thoughtful engagement. I think the coalition building is a great way to describe that. Um, you know, and for example, like there are plenty of events that exist in the space. I think where we've kind of sit in a really interesting position is trying to figure out how we can move that forward in actionable ways and recruiting you know, individuals and also ensuring that that is built into our work about how we can do that in very structured sort of fashion. So super excited about that work. And we're going to have um, some, some jobs we'll be posting in the beginning of September that will be building out that capacity. So watch the space. Yeah. Um, but additionally to that, I um, wanted to kind of segue a little bit from that because and give you one second. I'm going to let my dog in. Oh. There's Zelda. She's also very a big, much, much a fan of technology oversight. Um, the additional element there. So um, thinking through, we've had some really deep conversations about um, how governance for this work operates on a number of different levels. Um, just as kind of a, a basic background, if you're not familiar with how IOI came into being, I mean, originally started as a coalition out of an event, um, the Joint Roadmap of Open Science Tools. Um, and uh, in kind of late 2018, with a number of individuals, Catherine Skinner being one of them, um, who raised their hand and said, yes, we want to make this happen. How can we move that forward? So that work has evolved into, I mean, in, incredibly grateful for the uh, the minds that we've had dedicated to this work um, into a 20 person steering committee who have been essentially the team for IOI before we were able to bring on staff and, and contractors, um, which has been just a huge, huge, um, huge value add. But we've been having these deep conversations about, okay, with this next phase of work, with this sort of growth moment for IOI, what, um, what should governance look like? to help further bolster this work. And at a foundational level, um, you know, how should we be engaging with community stakeholders? How can we also, you know, conversations around ensuring that if we're gonna be making funding um, recommendations, making sure that we're not getting into kind of uh, sticky waters or um, murky waters around self-dealing, you know, having infrastructure providers on a steering body that are making funding recommendations. And so also making sure that we're sort of de-risking and being really clear about the expectations and, and modes of engagement for the support that we have. Um, and so there's been some very robust conversations in addition to building off of um, some work that we had contracted out with Dieta Jones and her team to build out anti-racist like board domination processes and evaluation for that, to think about what are the, what are the perspectives and how do we want to think about not only the steering committee, but these kind of community councils as responsive ways so that we can um, build out this work. Um, one of the things, and I'll turn it over to Catherine from here, um, we've stood up a governance and nominating committee. Um, you'll see in the post that is calling for steering committee nominations, and we're really kind of looking for something pretty radically different and putting a, a kind of flag in the ground, so to speak, to say, like, we recognize that we are operating in an ecosystem that is sick. Um, we operate in a space where we need some fresh ideas. Um, we also need to, you know, build out our representation in the world, um, bring in voices of individuals who are really putting um, service to community at the core of what they do, whether or not they operate within higher ed research or scholarship. And so opening that more broadly to, um, think about those that might be, say, involved in the tech platform governance issues. The Clarivate ProQuest acquisition, $5.3 billion. The Amazon recent um, MGM acquisition was $8 billion. We're talking about significant amounts of money, significant, you know, um, comparisons with other big, uh, you know, platform commodification, monopolization sort of issues. So do we have sort of that expertise there as well? Also for those that are looking at coalition building in radically different ways, funding models in radically different ways um, so that we're not getting into the same traps of perpetuating um, modes of operating that we're all very accustomed to based on how we're situated to power. Um, so Catherine, I would love to have you kind of speak a little bit more as someone who's been very closely involved in this process um, about that and how that is kind of per, um, percolating and, and kind of moving through our work as well. 
Absolutely happy to do so. So, you know, the, the thing that I'll say, kind of jumping off of some of the things that Kay was just saying, you know, this evolved out of an event. It was a bunch of people who had ideas that were similar enough and that were grounded enough that they felt like it was time to try to actually move this forward. So, you know, with that said, from 2018 until uh, now, I think what IOI has been doing is emerging um, as an organization. It's been testing the efficacy of the idea. It's been uh, testing some initial projects um, and some initial directions, and it is now actualizing. So from a governance standpoint, and like Vanessa, I, I mean, governance is part of what I love. Um, not because I love bulky or you know crazy attention to governance, but instead because I feel like when we give it due respect at the beginning and get things in place well, it produces more healthy organizations and they do better things in the world. And that's, that's why I care about governance. What has been remarkable to me working both with this group of people and then as Caitlin was hired as the uh, executive director, really under the auspices of a project. And then, you know, again, this is all like evolving in real time. Um, nobody was clingy. So I think from the beginning, one of the things that all of us on the steering committee have said is we're not the right people to be moving this forward. We all have a stake in this. And that's why this idea resonates so much. And at least most of those of us that are at the table um, are coming from very similar backgrounds, points of view. We, we have worked on projects together. We are an insular group. That's not gonna change the system. That's gonna reinforce the system even if we're angry with the system. So there has been this great sense of mindfulness, I think throughout the process, really from 2018 when I got involved all the way forward about not only accountability and oversight, which is part of what we're pursuing, um, but also about who can be involved in that process and who should be involved in that process and how that should be scoped and, and how that needs to change as this moves from kind of project nascent idea, you know, test case to something that is truly being implemented and formed um, to do good in our sector and beyond. Um, and I think that's one of the other things that I'll say from the steering committee side, um, the initial steering committee, at least most of the members knew from the get-go too, that we really don't want the usual players. We don't want a bunch of librarians and archivists and uh, publishers running this. It's got to be people with a diverse range of backgrounds that understand different parts um, and that bring new skills to the table. Because again, we're not going to solve the problem with the same team that's already embroiled in the problem. So with all of that said, um, I think that, you know, radically rethinking representation, um, you know, has been on the table from the first meeting. It was very white, very not even North American focused, but Canadian and, and US focused. Um, with a few people from elsewhere. Um, we, you know, tried to grow that to the degree we can. You're always hampered in these volunteer efforts by a million things, including that if you lean on the same people who get leaned on all the time, then, you know, you're, you're reinforcing some of the same problems anyway. So we've struggled with that. And we've struggled with the fact that bias is inevitable. Like there's no way, there was no way we could get this off the ground without bias being there. What's not inevitable is accepting it. And so that kind of rigorous reevaluation, Caitlin bringing in Dieta Jones and Associates, um, you know, the constant conversations that we've had and the constant action we've we've taken on to try to decentralize the um, kind of typical voices in this process has been really important. And what's super fun right now is that we're moving from this early opt-in moment where, you know, the opt-in was a bunch of, you know, similar thinking, maybe more different than a lot of groups, but still similar thinking people to that group saying, we don't have to stay on this. And in fact, for all of us to stay on this is going to be sick for the organization and for what it's trying to do. And so that means that thoughtfulness and real, uh, you know, deep and penetrating work in trying to build a more equitable governance model um, is here and being actualized by Kay, by Vanessa, um, and by those that are, you know, helping to bring this into being. 
one of the big pieces of that is also recognizing that that steering committee is never going to be enough. It doesn't matter whether it's 20 people like it is right now, if it's 100 people, God forbid, which I would never want to serve on anything that had a board of 100 people, um, or even 20 people for that matter, I think that's too big. Um, no matter how many voices you put in that kind of power position, they're not going to be able to um, bring all of the perspectives that are necessary. And particularly as the aims and ambitions of IOI are realized and new projects, and new activities are taken on, the needs are going to change. And so the community council model is being adopted in part because it ensures a responsiveness. It means that the community need is going to be embedded throughout. It's not going to be a set of kind of esteemed players who sit in some you know quiet closed room make decisions and then that gets enacted instead they're going to be all of these different on roads for community members so i think that's all y'all really need to hear from me um, as a steering committee member as somebody who's been going through this i think that you know even um you know part we 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 meaning, I think a lot of the group, certainly Kay, um, knew that these kinds of community vehicles were gonna be needed for IOI and that figuring out how to onboard people in ways that don't take so much facilitation that they take more time away than they do add the voices that you need. Um, and so there's always that balancing point. But really when we started working on the Clearbait and ProQuest response uh, moment, was an, an incredibly important moment where we were like, all right, <laughs> so this is this group can no longer do all the things it needs to do. We can get the statement out. We involved a couple of people that were outside of the kind of usual suspects that have been at the table. Um, and then it needs to be it, it needs to be broader. It needs we need easier ways to bring people in. So that is what you're all here to um, help IOI begin to do. So thank you, Kay, for giving me a second to talk. Maybe oh, thank you, Catherine. a second. And yeah, <laughs> terrific work on this. No, thank you, Catherine. And I, you know, to me, it's all about sort of the some kind of checks and balances, right? Like there's um there's a really important position that I think IOI can, you know, operates in and is stepping into in terms of operating outside of the you know academy in various ways serving as that accountability mechanism ensuring that you know our work is not only as kind of transparently shared but anchored in research and evidence and data to the extent that we can and as well as having structured mechanisms for bringing in as much community input as we can um, to ensure that we're not operating with those blind spots um, it's never going to be perfect but i do think it is a really um, important component while also with the individuals that we are having conversations with and the nominations process that we've got open and um, for the steering committee as well as oversight and all these other sorts of things, um, ensuring that we're challenging our assumptions at a really fundamental level and continuing to do so. You know, no more conversation about, oh, you know, that's really nice, but it works in this part of the world and it would never work here. It's like, well, why not? Like, let's actually fundamentally investigate that. Why, why are we not actually talking about a more fundamental shift there? Who do we need to learn from? Um, and especially for, for my sort of work in terms of leading the organization, building up this team, actively seeking those sources of inspiration and people we can learn from, be they from, mutual aid, solidarity economy, cooperatives, um, community building organizations, bringing rural, or bringing broadband to rural spaces, economists that have worked in various other sorts of government agency, et cetera, um, thinking through, you know, what is, what is the interesting group of individuals that we can learn that, you know, current members of the community, current steering committee members um, can help inform and we can think through how do we apply those strategies to this space. So super excited that we've got a couple of different mechanisms to engage that we're, we're rolling out. And to me, they're all interconnected in this, you know, growing of the work and ensuring that we are staying true to our mission and uh, exploring that space in the most authentic way we can. Okay, there are some questions in the chat from Christina. Oh, thank you. I've not been following the chat, so my apologies. Here we go. Great addition to this conversation. 
Cool, cool, cool. Um, We're already speaking um, to it. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> Let's see. Um, discussions about having economists on, yes, economists on the steering committee, for sure. Um, we sort of, uh, it was interesting just to speak to that uh, quickly. We had started, it was really fascinating. So with the um, governance and nominating committee, as you do in these conversations of like, well, what, what do we, what additional perspectives do we need? What does a candidate profile look like? Um, who are the types of people that we want to have? And we started to kind of map those out. And actually kind of feeling a little bit stuck. It's like, really, I mean, IOI exists because it's easy to say what's not enough. Getting to the strategy of like how to get there is why we exist, right? Like, you know, it's, a, it's enough to say that there's not enough money. We don't feel like there's enough money, but like, how do you actually operationalize that? We hit that sort of similar um, crunchy sort of space where we were talking about building out the steering committee about like, you know, we knew that we didn't want to necessarily have it the first iteration, we might evolve towards it and saying like, we need, you know, one person from this part of the world, one person who fits this mold, one person who fits this mold. Um, but yes, um, we are in active conversations with some that can also bring that uh, economics background to, um, to this work, as well as those that are looking at, for example, different funding models in various ways, those that can lend different um, perspectives as we build out sort of our offerings for funders and for institutions and for infrastructure providers, um, people who've got different demonstrated um, track records of success of doing that work in various, various dimensions in service of community those that are centering equity and opportunity and access at the core of their work, um, those that are familiar with other sort of funding models, um, different collective funding models, um, as well as those that can offer different connections and expand our, our reach to groups around the world that we know are not present in the conversations and got a pretty good in inclination that they are the ones that we should be sort of focusing on. So again, like, you know, who um, is showing up in the work and also who's not and how can we get there? How can we expand, um, you know, and better our understanding of what those needs might be um, to kind of counter our, our own sort of familiarity in the space too. So I hope that answers some of the questions. Yeah, parallel civic and public serving efforts outside of Skullcom is, is sort of intentionally what we are looking for. And, you know, even for example, um, you know, I know there's a lot of the conversations around digital infrastructure more broadly in civil society, but also community organizations and those that are, you know, looking to, you know, help with sort of um, environmental justice, um, economic revitalization of specific communities thinking really deeply about how to operationalize on needs for um, you know, specific regions, specific communities, specific underrepresented groups, um, you know, very different uh, in many ways sort of um, problem sets that do have some similarities. So for example, and then I'll hand it over to Vanessa, you know, for example, say, you know, I live in New York City, there is a, a big request for proposals for um, broadband, for broadband extensions to certain communities. Um, some of the conversations I've had with individuals that are focusing on digital equity for that, the organizations who are leading that work in the Bronx and other sorts of areas um, that are doing really deep capacity building, engagement, prototyping, service to community, don't qualify for the RFP because the RFP has said that they need to serve at least 10,000 individuals and they serve 2,000, but they should be the people that are supported through an RFP similar to that. We have heard similar stories about why open infrastructure projects lose bids for open science platforms in the Netherlands, why they lose bids within institutions and get stuck in procurement. Like it is a very similar conversation. You know, are there people around the world that are looking at different ways of kind of countering that or helping to support that or people that can bring their experiences to that. So it's, it's also given us an opportunity to broaden our engagement with others um, in various other sectors and regions of the world. And that work is sort of ongoing over the next few months as well. Uh, it, for committee members, just looking at Zoe's question here, um, Vanessa will be talking about how we're focusing on that for um, the community councils. We do have um, a 
uh, a budget line for equitable participation and support. Um, all of our webinars that we've been running recently, all of those participants are compensated for their time. Um, we'll be talking through what that structure looks like for these community councils as well. Um, for uh, the steering committee, that is an open conversation because we're still talking about the size of that steering committee, but we do have budget allocated for um, ensuring adequate participation and compensation for um, individuals' time as well. It's a great question. And if anybody ever wants to talk about putting an equitable participation budget line into a grant and not having anyone like bat an eye at it, but just saying like, I need $60,000. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's my new favorite thing. Literally just yeah. had a conversation with Melon about it. It is my new favorite. Yeah. So we could have a whole conversation about what that means. Part of that is also like covering childcare for some programming yeah. that we're doing exactly. and others, but we could, yes, let's, that should be a conversation. Um, Yay, Mel I mean, yay. <laughs> Melon seems to be on, on it with that being a, a line in their grants. Um, I know we should we could have a whole conversation probably at some point about like strategically setting up your 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 uh, grant proposals and budgets as Kayla knows. I also love having it's that. important and it's and, it's, and well. it's it's tough. I mean, we again like in terms of that examination. You know, we are looking for individuals that this is a working board. Our current steering committee meets every two weeks. We are not looking to perpetuate that, I feel like, on a monthly basis. But, um, you know, the the level of engagement has been really special. And so wanting to also be explicit about how that time is sort of allocated and how we're, um, what sort of participation we're, we're putting forward for that. Um, but that's, I'm just keep, I'm not, I know. Ahead. I go. I was like, it's a nice tie-in. So I'll just take that and I'm gonna it. tie it in, and then I'm going to try to squeeze all my stuff into the next ten minutes. So, um, though obviously there will be ample time to have additional conversation, and and we are definitely available. Um, you know, I think the tie-in being, you know, I think everything, you know, the 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 you know one of the many reasons why i really like working with caitlin is that you know we can be really in the weeds on you know in terms of making sure that we are creating anything that we do that we're modeling it so again like fair fair labor practices like nobody should be participating in anything and not having any amount of compensation again we're working parents hyper mindful of that um in terms of um participation and also the you know the also the intersectionality of all these pieces also very aware of what it looks like because we're also at the end of the day two white women like we are like that like we don't need more white women I mean, we need good white women, but you know, Caitlin and I are like, we know where we need to be able to step back and create space because you don't need more of this. Um, and so I think that, you know, in a lot of ways, so I'll talk sort of broadly about the 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 council model, but within specifically the oversight piece, because that's the piece I've been helping to stand up. And I'm hoping to stand it up and then I am stepping back and out. Um, again, we don't need more of me or any of this in this. It's not the the right. Um, space. And I think that um, the council model, you know, as we're trying to, you know, this idea being that, you know, to disrupt structures, we have to try new structures or, or we have to eliminate structures. And so all of this is experimental and all of it is intended to um, be iterative. And none of this is intended to be precious. So the sense that like what is happening now and being laid out may change. It may look different next year. It may look different the year after that. And it's that type of, you know, iterative approach to the work that's going to be really important. And I think that the councils are, are a really crucial part of that iteration because the councils can kind of uh, exist and not exist as is appropriate and, and as is needed. And I think that's really important because right now, yes, we're standing up an oversight council, but maybe in a year or two years, that's not, it's there's not an oversight council because there's an entire advocacy and policy arm of IOI, or maybe there's something else. So it gives us space to sort of say, this is what's needed now. This is what that, these are the people or the type of people that are needed now. And, and, and we know that that, is going to change. And I think, again, it's shifting how we also in all of this think about what is successful outputs. Like, you know, is having something exist in perpetuity, you know, set up a certain way and happening the same way over and over and over again, like that actually doesn't count as success anymore. Like that might actually not be the right thing because you lose sight of the actual 
guts and heart of what you're trying to do. And it, there's too much focus on the mechanics. So just in terms of like why the councils exist, um, you know, the, the councils in a lot of ways and the oversight council specifically is intended to be an agent of disruption and change. I mean, there, it's intended to be a space where uncomfortable conversations are going to be had. It's intended to be the thing that says, you know, both uh, look both internally into IOI and say like that, like, why are we doing that? Like, why are we doing a thing? Why are we doing it that way? Why are we working with that organization? Why are we taking money this way? Um, it's intended to be the thing that is literally given license to ask the hard questions. Um, it's also intended to, um, you know, do that also back into the community saying, here's where we need to be better, or here's, here's, here's things that the community is doing that might be causing harm. How do we do that differently? And then also in terms of the good, how are we, how are we, you know, how are we problem solving or supporting or showcasing things that are happening that could be repeatable models that could be, you know, something that could be happening at one institution around, um, you know, coalition building um, around, you know, data use, um, you know, might be able to sort of say, hey, that's something we should lift up because IOI has the ability to lift up things too. And I think sort of knowing, like, I think it's really important always to sort of know, you know, we've talked a lot, all of this is really talking a lot about power um, and power dynamics and where that is. I think the thing about having something like an IOI and having any type of organization that is outside of certain structures, it has the ability to um, have power or support or advocate for others who might not be in the same spot of the power hierarchy. And I think that is a piece that I know Kayla and I have talked a lot about like that, you know, for those who might need like a little bit of a boost or giant boost, this is this, like these counselors are way are active points in to do that. So, um, and then and to sort of say, and then I'll go kind of into the mechanics, which is like probably the least glamorous of all, but just to like talk a bit more about the, the mechanic piece. My sort of joke is like, if it, if the, it's specifically, at least with the Oversight Council, like if we're not making people uncomfortable with some of the things that are coming out, then we're not doing it right. Because the the over like oversight is actually about challenging the status quo and it should all make everybody a little uncomfortable. And, and that actually is okay. I mean, I speak this as somebody who works with like, you know, Dr. Sophia Noble and I work at a center that's like everything we do, I think every day is like pissing people off, but in the thoughtful ways to make things better. Like there are ways to, you know, having wrong intentions, you know, learning to do that in ways that are respectful, I think is really important because that's how we actually end up having great. Um, in terms of the, you know, the IOI council, both the model and the mechanics is, um, is so, and again, trying to be mindful of like, you know, we've talked a lot about trying to disrupt with the steering committee. I'd say with the, the oversight council, you know, we're kind of having folks who, who for the start around in terms of the, the council itself that have both like a foot in and a, in like the research library space. So in some of the known spaces, but are also have their foot in some of these other spaces. So whether it's legislative, whether it's social racial um, justice, whether it's uh, looking at uh, incarceration. So some of these names are, so some names we know, so I'll share some, and then some we don't know, but the model makeup chairs, the council, um, and the co-chairs for the oversight council are going to be um, Sarah Lambden, who any of you saw the webinar, so scholar, librarian, um, author, um, oh, there's Sarah on vacation. That was her like quick vacay drop in um, <laughs> or somewhere nice in the woods. Um, and uh, Shay Swager, who we also heard from in the webinar as well. Again, looking at things from abolitionist approaches. Um, the, the core council is still being uh, uh, finished and finalized. So we'll share more of that next week. Um, Jenny Halperin is also part of who's waving, who is there as well. Um, and some 
places, including Rob Montoya, who is actually en route to Italy at this moment, not happily. Um, but he is an assistant professor at UCLA. He also runs uh, the Cal RBS school and focuses on uh, justice, ethics, um, uh, and data as well. Um, Selfish, he's also a colleague of mine, I adore him, um, but he's also bringing more and more Latina, Latinos into the, the library and research space. Um, and there'll be a few others. Within that ecosystem, there are then also supporting advisors. And the advisors are crucial because they have been people who have both been anchors in this work. So people like Tina, who's Tina Bach, who's on the call. There's Tina in, in an office, I believe. We've got Robin Ruggaber. Um, and then Stacy Wood, who is not here because she's on Pacific time. Um, and there'll be space for more because the advisors really, it, again, mechanically, in terms of the, the logistics, and this will all be in a blog post because we don't, it's all things you can read and none of it's really that exciting. Um, and then it's sort of, and then kind of uh, engagement publicly with the community. So the idea being is that you've got steering, you've got councils, councils will be comprised of co-chairs, they'll be comprised of council members, they'll be comprised of advisory community members, and then the larger community. And, and the idea being too, that this will all, if, if done, if our experiment goes well, which again, all an experiment, ask me in two months, this may all change, um, that you know, it gives space too for, for bringing in folks, giving people space, allowing different spots of participation that again, also work with people's lives. Because I think what is really important is Catherine, I think noted, you know, for people who are the people who kind of engage in these spaces, who uh, volunteer to participate or who are involved in, in improving or changing, whether it's their own communities, their work communities or the communities at large, it's a it's a lift. It's an emotional burden. It's a work burden. It's you know there's additional labor, and I think we want to make spaces that, no matter where you are in terms of your own personal professional space, there will be places for you to plug in when it when it works for you. And so know that like if being you know you're interested in participating in a council, um, and you can't. Ah, good question, Christina. I'm going to come to that in a second. Um, you know, is it going to, like, can you plug in now? Or maybe, you know, in two years, you're done with grad school and like some other big project and you want to be able to plug in. Those type of things exist. Um, sort of lastly, too, with like the, you know, so great question, Christina. So, so the intention is no. Um, and the hope, again, I think, is we will see some of that you know, this is one of the things I'll say, honestly, we're trying to figure out specifically as it relates to some of the, like, does it, for example, and again, this is just all part of our experiment, make sense to have, you know, another subgroup that is specifically looking internationally? Do we interweave that with the existing group? Is there, like, how do we start to, and part of it is also with this group figuring that out, because um, what does that look like from a coalition building advocacy uh, policy perspective, um, you know, are we looking at domestic policy? Are we looking at international policy? We're specifically looking at UK policy. I mean, these are the questions that keep me up at night. So I think, again, these are questions I think that we hope that people will think through. And we're not, in, and again, not coming with all the answers because we don't, because there's a lot of complexity. And part of this is just having, um, you know, as many people as we can participating in both um, identifying the right things we do want to, what are the things we want to hold and cherish and anchor this in? So anchor in like equitable, just um, principles, but also saying, okay, bye Jenny. Um, but also what are the things that need to, we can move? And I think, again, it's all part of the figuring it out. So I think with that, there are ways to, we'll sort of reshare the blog, put the posts. If you're interested, there is a form to either sign up for like, just kind of being like, like knowing what's going on. So more of like a list of perspective, we're sort of figuring out those mechanisms. Um, we have a lot of interest in advisory members. So we'll be reaching back out to folks specifically about that part. And then we'll be sharing more in terms of everything that I'm talking really quickly about, but also I'll put this all in a blog post after this meeting. So it'll be available and other ways for people to kind of plug in with like maybe 30 seconds to spare. Kaylin. 
Um, huge thanks for everyone for joining. We will be putting all these details in. Um, again, if you have any colleagues that were unable to join that are interested in participating, we have another call that is going to be at 7 p.m. Eastern tonight, which is 2300 UTC. Um, you know, and that also will be going over similar elements of what we did here. So if you join for now, don't feel like you need to join for that next call. Um, and lastly, for that um, point on for Christina is about the intentionality of being non-US. We also are kind of crafting a few different areas that we know we want this um, oversight group to help us explore, but really putting it into the hands of those co-chairs to think about how to move that work forward. And so um, it's not intended as sort of like a, a half, um, half thought through answer, but really wanting them to you know be able to breathe into that with a sense of agency, um, how that work takes form and shape with our support, but without necessarily the heavy handedness and also the experimentation of getting started and being able to evolve from there too. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, huge thanks gang. I know we're a minute over. Um, more information will be coming out soon. Um, you can reach, always reach Vanessa and I uh, through, you know, email. email contacts etc and also keep an eye out we're going to have a, a blog post out soon so thanks, thanks again Vanessa and Catherine. Thanks, thanks everybody Joe. thanks robin thanks Sarah. bye have fun on vacation sarah <laughs> by the way